Okay, usually in our right, usually in our Zoom bingo, I already had like you're muted. I had, can you see my screen? I saw a cat today. I really hope that I don't fill my cart because the next one is failed connection. So let's not fill our Zoom bingo today. Let's leave that for the break. Um, also, I'm not too worried that we went over time with the project checkout because I usually go too fast and I hope I won't be extremely fast. And for the first time I have a dual monitor setup. So when I'm looking sideways, I'm actually looking at you. And when I'm looking this way, I'm looking on, on my slides. I know it's weird, but this is how I'm trying to gauge the audience. All right. So first, before I start, I would like to say a big thank you to Valentina who reviewed my slides, gave me extremely valuable feedback and she kind of helped me tie this up with her tutorial. Before I start, I'm going to explain a little bit about the data sets that we're going to be using. So it's plastic pellets uh, found uh, ashore in the beach. And usually there are pictures like this one. And we open them using scikit image. We separate just the pellets, remove them from the background. And then we try to get the dominant color of the pellet. So in this case, this is the picture from the uh, microscope. We remove the background and then we get the dominant color. And our data set are the values of red, greens, and blue of this dominant color. And the goal that we're gonna try to do with our various machine learning techniques is to figure out the yellowing index of these pellets, which is somehow related with their age uh, for how long they are at the, at the beach. So for this particular one, it's very eroded, but you can see there is some yellowing here already which means that it has been on the beach for quite some time. All right, so just gonna be a quick introduction to machine learning using a practical example with this data set. So these notebooks are a brief hands-on introduction. We are gonna revise some nomenclature, some principles, and I hope you remember uh, Valentina's presentation. Um, she actually went into more depth than what I'm going here. Okay, machine learning is gonna solve all problems, right? So we give them an image, we ask them to crunch the numbers, and there you go, we have this cow that is about 5.2 meters. Sounds good, right? We solve the problem. And uh, no, we need a human. Any human will know that we have at least three cows in these pictures, right? There is one in the background and two here. There is no such a thing as a 5.2 meters cow, but the computer doesn't know. So we still need humans. Um, machine learning is not gonna solve all of our problems. And this tutorial is actually most about that. Um, is the font size okay? You can put that on your bingo card. It looks okay, Felipe. Okay, thank you. So what is machine learning? Before I go into that, some caveats. I'm not a statistician, I'm not a mathematician, and I'm not even a machine learning expert. I only play one online. And you can find my works on moves and plays like how do I get by with little to no data? Oh gosh, the PI wants some buzzwords in the report and fuzzy logic no longer does it. We need machine learning or AI or deep learning or insert here the next buzzword. This is just a joke because some people go into machine learning just for the buzzword, but it's actually useful. And this is my view of what machine learning is. This is really my personal view. Um, it focuses on practical problems. Um, we can learn from the data and make predictions from it. This is actually interesting because that, doesn't that define science in general? And it's a middle ground between statistics and optimization techniques. I can really relate to that one because I started my career as a photographer with um, data simulation techniques. So, I used a lot of optimization techniques. There are, in an essence, some sort of machine learning. And this is probably the most important. We have fast computers now, so we can crunch numbers much, much easier than before. So some of these techniques, use, they were abandoned. They are actually very old, but they were abandoned because we didn't have computing power for that. There is this talk from, uh, by Jake Vanderplan on bootstrapping techniques and other uh, high computing statistics, how high demanding statistics that you can do in your data that's worth watching um, and you should do this during the break. It's very short, if I'm not mistaken, which kind of correlates to the bootstrapping techniques to classic statistics. And you can see how we can leverage these fast computers to do uh, this kind of number crunchings. So, all right, a very oversimplified take. 
machine learning is we fit a model to the data and we try to use this model to make predictions. This is so simple and so straightforward that actually the whole API of Scikit-Learn, which is the main model that we're gonna use, is designed around that. It's usually fit and predict, fit and predict. Some vocabulary before we start. We have parameters, which are the variables that define our model and control its behavior. We have the model, it's a set of mathematical equations that we use to approximate the data. We have our labels or classes, which is a quantity or a category that we want to predict. We have our features, which means that they are our observations or the information that we have to predict our labels and classes. And then we have our training where we use the features on non-labels, sometimes they're unknown, we don't have those, to fit the model and estimate the parameters. So we come full circle, right, in our vocabulary. But why stop now? We can throw some more words at you. So let's do that. There are the hyperparameters, which are the variables that influence the training and the model, but they are not estimated during the training. There is unsupervised learning, where we extract information and structure from the data without training, uh, with the non-labels and the first two techniques we're going to try is exactly that we are not we are going to pretend that we don't know the labels and then there is the supervised learning where we do use the labels that we have to check if our model is performing well and actually use them within our model um, okay so the first one that we're going to use is an unsupervised method which is the pca the principal component analysis you are all probably familiar with PCA already because PCA is kind of common in oceanography before the machine learning hype. So the data set that we use are, consists of reds, greens, and blue composites of the palette scholar from uh, more than 130 photos, if I'm not mistaken. And the labels that we're not gonna use on unsupervised, we're not gonna use them to check our model. They are the yellowing index, which means how yellow the pellet got since they uh, washed ashore. This is our table of data. So we have here red, green, and blue. We have some extra information like size. Um, this is not really the color. Um, it's more, let's say, the original color of the plastic. For example, blue plastic needs a blue pellet, but it can get yellow with time. Um, so most of them are transparent or white. Um, usually they are transparent or white because they are colored afterwards. I think it's pretty rare to have colored palettes already. Some description, description of the palette, if they are cylinder, spheres, or if they are broken, uh, the erosion index, and then the yellowing index. And both the erosion and the yellowing, uh, we also convert it to numbers in case we want to check that way. Okay, so let's plot some histograms of the data to take a look at it. Um, let's take a look at the erosion. Um, it's kind of almost homogeneous distribution. Colored, the vast majority are transparent to white, which is ex expected. There's just a few parts that were yellow, but this is yellow in color, not the yellowing that they get with the sun with time. Um, the description of which the sites are kind of all over the place, but the vast majority are just spheres. Um, they are palettes after all. And here's the yellowing index, the labels uh, or classes that we want to predict. So most of our palettes have low yellowing, um, high and moderate are kind of homogeneous and very few, uh, very high yellowing um, index. And Felipe, we do have one participant wondering where we can view your slides that you're going through right now. Oh, this is a problem. I literally just updated all these slides 10 minutes before this. So we do have, a older version uh, in our repository. I'm sorry, but I didn't have time to commit this version. I will do this as soon as I'm done here. Okay, so those will be and, available later. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there is, there is a version uh, of this there, full of typos and some mistakes. <laughs> this always happens with our tutorials. We always tweak them at the last minute, especially the one with the palettes and the picture. I literally just create that like five minutes before logging into Zoom. Thanks to Valentina who told me to do that because not everybody know what a pellet, a plastic pellet is. Okay, so we're gonna be using the red, green, and blue data for now. Uh, so I'm just separating that from our data set. And before we go into any fancy technique, it's nice to take a look at basic statistics. So this is our correlation map. 
we can see here that the red and the blue have a very low correlation. The green um, and the blue have some correlation and the red and the green have some higher correlation. And keep that in mind as we progress because we're gonna use this always as um, an anchor to see if our machine learning or PCA or whatever we're doing makes sense afterwards. We expect a high correlation between the red and the green and some correlation between the green and the blue and pretty much no correlation between the red and the blue. Okay, so the first step before doing a machine learning is to standardize the data because we don't want high variance in data to bias our model. Standardize the data is when we extract the mean divided by standard deviation. Uh, we apply that to our um, RGB data frame and then we have the Z-score data and in this case, um, we can check if the standardization is correct. For example, here our standard deviation is one, which is what we want from a standardization, and our mean is zero. Um, uh, someone that's paying attention said, oh, that's not zero. There are some numbers in there, but yeah, floating points, right? I mean, this is basically zero. Okay, so let's go to our model. The first thing that we do, we import from Scikit to learn the composition the PCA module. We start an object. When you do number of components none, we're gonna solve for all the components, but you can truncate this to one, two, or whatever number of components you wanna do. Uh, Scikit to learn has this really nice HTML uh, inspection of the object. But here in this particular case, because it's just a PCA, it's not really that interesting, right? Um, we can see, we know that we're only running the PCA. And like I said, we have model and fit, right? Pretty much everything in scikit to learn is divided like that, model and fit. And sometimes there is a transform method to transform the data. So the PCA object or the fit of the model was designed around uh, before pandas existed. So it returns just NumPy arrays. But now that we have pandas, we can do better. We can add labels to the results. So let's do that. So pretty much we're gonna get my PCA components, uh, just a transpose of it to make it look nicer. And I'm gonna call that loadings. These are my loading values for my PCA. And I'm gonna um, add labels from the principal component one up to the last one. And I'm calling the all, uh, this two TS, which kind of relates to a time series of principal components. And if your access was time, this would actually be a time series. Uh, you can see my physical oceanographer bias here when I name this time series. If there is um, a statistician there or people from ecology, they will be appalled by that for me calling this a time series. Okay, so we can do a projection of our loadings in our data, which is the dot products of our loadings to the original data frame. And then we can plot this projection. What do we see? So on the PC1, the first component axis, we can see that the red and the green are kind of close together. We expect that because they are highly correlation, uh, correlated as we saw in our correlation plot. But they are far away from the blue. In our second component, we can see that the red and the green are far away, but they're not far away, like the green and the blue are closer now, right? When you see only on the vertical axis here which kind of makes sense. We saw that the green and the blue are kind of correlated, 0.48 if I'm not mistaken. So we can use our correlation plot to kind of validate or get at least some confidence in our PCA. Our PCA is working. Uh, another thing that we can do, we can plot the non-projected loadings uh, with all the labels to see if there, we can cluster the data within our classes. And for that, we created some uh, different symbols and colors for our classes. Here, I'm in a way cheating because I'm using the classes uh, to color my, my data, but in theory, this is unsupervised um, learning. So the classes did not enter in our analysis whatsoever for the PCA. And then I do this loop where I colored and mark every class. And this is the distribution of the non-projected um, loadings. As you can see, this is the very high uh, yellowing index, kind of has a cluster here. Then the high uh, yellowing index has some cluster here, the low kind of cluster here, but the moderate is all over the place. So our PCA is not really good to uh, 
separate and to classify our model uh, because it kind of messed up by the moderator. By the way, I'm not sure if you can hear this. There is a sound car outside. And usually in Brazil, that's also a bingo mark in our Zoom meetings. It's called Carro do Ovo, which is passing by and selling eggs. So that's probably something that you never heard before if you don't live in Brazil. And we have to wait for it to pass. Not sure if you can hear it. I can hear it. It's, just, it's pretty quiet, though. All right. Summary for the PCA. So the PCA is probably the most robust and easy uh, non-supervised machine learning to perform. It has been a common technique in ocean science before the machine learning hype. You all probably use it or saw it somewhere already. And from that, we learned that a single RGB value does not have enough predictive power to be used alone. We need some sort of combinations, at least red and green. And we showed that the loading plot um, has some overlaps, which means that we either have some problems with the data or the PCA was not enough to predict it. OK, so let's try something else. Let's try another unsupervised learning technique that's called k-means. So k-means tries to find the classes automatically for us. Remember, we, want, um, we have our real index as the truth. And we assess that using our PCA, but you saw there, there were some errors there with some overlaps. But now we can try to find natural clusterizations in the data with the k-means and see if the data kind of show, uh, show us if they can be um, separated leaving some sort of yellowing. Okay, so the very first thing we do, and we load the data again, um, we get our error index just for coloring, and we do what's called a pair plot in Seaborn. So this pair plot, because we use the hue, like the colors, uh, based on the yellow index, and we can see that we have some natural clusterization. So this is the very high, this is the high, this is the low, and again, the moderate, it's all over the place, mixing between those. There is no cluster, natural clusterization uh, of red, greens, and blue when it comes to size. There is some with red and green and blue, but most of the clusterization that we can see is between red and green, as we already know, because they are highly correlated. So this is good. So let's see if k-means can give us at least that. All right. Um, so for our pair plot, we saw the RGB size seems to be random. There, red and green seem to be linear correlated with the yellow index and the R and B and the G and B show some clusterization that may have some predictive power. Let's try a k-means and we need to tell the k-means how, how many clusters we want to find. Um, we want to find four clusters at least because we're going to try that with the size as well. See if size interferes in our analysis in any way. So we get our features, red, green, and blue in size. So we try to predict four clusters. Um, again, model and fit. This is a common pattern in scikit-learn. Pretty much everything in scikit-learn is like that. And this is our clusters. It doesn't tell us a lot. We need to plot that. So let's get only our featured columns. And voila. So this is, again, our pair plot. Ideally, we should put this pair plot side by side before our regional plot. So there are some clusters, like in this particular case here, um, red and blue, you can see very separated clusters. They just don't make sense with the yellow index that we had before. And on the red and green, where we expected a clusterization on this side and this side, that one is gone. They are actually along this, um, this line, which is not good, which means that we did find a clusterization. This clusterization is just not related to the yellow index that we wanted. But um, we kind of forgot about something, right? I mean, first of all, we get some nice clusterization. And we know that the yellow index that we have was done by an operator. The, a person went there and saw the palettes and said, this is yellow, this is very yellowed, this is not yellowed at all. So we could distrust our operator and say that, no, no, machine learning is right and our operator is wrong. But we should never do that. We know that a hum the chances of a human being wrong all the time, like 100% like that, is really, really low. And remember the call that I showed at the beginning? Like, 
there is a higher chance that the machine learning model is not performing well. So what are we missing? Why the performance is so bad? Well, the mean um, is not zero and the standard deviation is not one. And actually there is a high variance here on the blue, which means that we forgot to standardize our data. Okay, so let's standardize our data. But now instead of rolling our own z-score, let's try to use scikit-learn for that. Scikit-learn has this pre-processing sub-module and the pre-processed sub-model, there is a standard scalar class. Again, model fit. And because this one needs to be applied to the data, there is a transform. So we create the scalar, we fit to the data, and then we transform the data into the scaled data. And now we have a really nice zero mean data set and one standard deviation data set. Okay, let's do our k-means again with the scaled data now and see if we can increase our prediction power. Um, let me try to reduce this. All right. Again, we have some nice clusterization here, but it just doesn't correlate to the yellow index. As we saw before, we're expecting one cluster here, one cluster here, and something in between. They are, again, kind of along this line. We did change the scenario within size a little bit. It's a little bit more random. So we definitely reduce the influence of the size now. We reduce the influence of the high variance of the blue, but we're still not predicting what we wanted. Okay. So while this does seem a little bit closer to our yellow index, um, and even if we ignore the, the, the size variable there that should be random, um, we still don't match what our original operator got when they labeled our data. We can do some metrics to assess our model and how that compares with the operator. So we get the values for our operator and we do some accuracy score and it's 15%. So yeah, the k-means here is pretty bad. We can't use this at all. The PCA was probably better to predict our data. All right, negative results alert. Even if you trust most of our yellow index for the human operator, this clustering is still terrible and we can compare at all with, what's on, with what was on by the human. Machine learning is very help, helpful, but it's not a silver bullet. So if you have a werewolf problem, machine learning won't help you. You need to run, sorry, or hide. So our features are collated and there is some overlap and that may require a different technique or gather some more data because we cannot gather more data. Let's try another technique. Um, so before we moved to my last notebook, I just want to show that, especially for k-means, but also for my next one, the KNN, this um, tutorial was based on this also tutorial from Leo Ueda, a friend of mine, and he did get a positive uh, result. It's not a negative result. He used this on penguin data, and it's pretty cool. You should check the notebook out. They correlated with this one that I'm doing here. It's on more or less the same um, sequence of logic and the same sequence of cells. So it should be easier for you to understand his notebook after you go to mine. And it's nicer because he's actually work with his data. So he can actually predict penguin species based on several measurements that they do, um, like beak uh, size, weight, and all that. All right. So let's try a new technique. Let's see if we can get some information from this data. So let's try a supervised learning now. So the first two, the PCA and the K-means, it's unsupervised. We use the labels to check, but we didn't use the labels to train the model. Now it's different. We're gonna use the labels to train. So we have the human operator, we kind of trust the human operator. Um, and other examples of supervised learning is linear regressions. There is support vector machines, neural networks, including deep learning, and many more. And the simplest one that we can do and we can understand is the K in N, which means K nearest neighbor classifier, which use a certain number of neighbors within a point and known labels to label that. Say, if I'm close to three other people, uh, what are the chances of these three other people also speaks Portuguese? Very high, right? Because I'm Brazil, I'm Brazilian, I'm here. And so it keeps classifying people based on who are next to them. That's how KNN works. So again, load our data. 
Um, we know that size is pretty much random with our label, so we're going to drop the size now. We're just going to use R, G, and B. This is why I like to go from a simple to a more complex model, because our simple model gave us some insight. It didn't give us a model to predict, but it gave an insight that size doesn't matter here. And now, different from all of our previous models, we, we have the Y, the yellowing index, as part of our model. So we import the KNN classifier from scikit-learn and we fit the model. Again, model fit. In this case, we use the predict and we have this prediction. We have all this array of low, high, moderate, and very high yellowing. Let's check our accuracy and much better. We get 82% of accuracy with this model. What we did here, that's wrong. Error number one. Again, we forgot to standardize the data. Error number two, we use the whole data set, right, to train. So we're probably overfeeding. This model is great, but it's great for this data set. If we try to use this with new data out there, it's probably gonna be terrible. So before you saw this pre-processing that we did, and we can do it again and scale our data and now we can use the scale data to predict and compute again our accuracy. As you can see, our accuracy is lower, but this is probably not overfitting that much. And the lower score means that we are probably doing better than the k-means. Uh, our k-means was 15%, we're still at 78, 77, so we're still doing good. This is our pair plot. And now you can see those nice clustering as we saw with the original data. So this is good. Like we are predicting the low um, yellowing. We are predicting the high yellowing. Um, we have the same problem with the moderate yellowing, which now we can probably blame the data or the operator for that one. So we definitely need more data to separate this. Or maybe our RGB model is too simple for that. And this is just an aside on actually how scikit-learn works. We keep forgetting to standardize the data, right? So how can we stop forgetting about that? We can use pipelines. Scikit-learn is really nice where you can just pipe one method after the other. So if you import the pipeline, you can create a whole machine learning model from start to finish where you do the pre-processing. This can be custom, custom functions as well that you can create. You can do then the model, and then you can just apply the pipeline to the data. So everything is gonna happen in sequence. This one is too simple, it's just two steps, but some machine learning um, pipelines can be extremely huge. And that HTML object that I showed earlier in the PCA can be very useful for you to, to check your pipeline visually. It's pretty much a workflow with your data. All right, we're still using the whole data set. So there's still some overfitting we can do some validation and not using the whole data set. So we can do what is called train test split, where we separate some of the data to train, some of the data to validate. And in this case, we are gonna use the default. I believe the default is 80% um, train, 20% to validate. So here is our split data set. Now we do feed on the train. Oh, I have to run this again to show the model. I actually want to show you that. So let me see if I can do that. I apologize, just widgets, sometimes they, do sh they don't show up. I need to save it. Yes, there you go. So remember that HTML uh, representation of our um, scikit-learn objects, this is the representation of the pipeline. So imagine if you have like a huge pipeline with several pre-processing steps and several models and transformations and scalars, this is very handy to take a look at everything that you're doing. So our pipeline has the standard scalar and then the KNN model. I actually saw one that took two pages. And in that case, even this nice HTML representation doesn't really help. And now we compute our accuracy against the test data, the data that was set apart. And as expected, our accuracy now is much, much lower than before because we have less data to train and we are no longer overfeeding on the data. 
it's still better than the k-means, like 62, not 15, but we can do better. And we can use cross-validation with the whole data set. And then we can take the average of this because these are several runs on, on the validation. And then we can increase our score to 70%, which is pretty good for such a low data set. So such a small data set, sorry. So we did reduce our accuracy when we performed the train test speed. It was 70 to 70, we reduced it to 70. And what happened is that our model may be data hungry. We may be, we need more data there. And we just don't have enough samples to predict each class. And what do I mean by that? Remember our histogram from the beginning where we saw that most of our class, most of our data falls on the, this class, on the low yellowing. And we have very little on this class, the very high yellowing, which means that our data is not balanced. So the data is imbalanced. Our model doesn't perform well with imbalanced data. We need to balance that. We can use, um, tape, I forgot the name now, I'm so sorry, I'm drawing a blank, but we can use partitions of the data and these partitions are gonna be balanced. We can collect more data, of course, that would be even better. Or we can try a more robust data set like decision trees, like random forest is part of the family of decision trees. I'm not going to go into that, mostly because I didn't have the time to do it, but decision trees are a, sequ are, um, <clears throat> a sequence of linear models that kind of similar to the KNN, but are way more robust with unbalanced data and can yield a much better result. There is this awesome paper on how decision trees are better than deep learning for tabular data like this one. I recommend you to check those out. And that's it, that's all I had. I hope I wasn't too fast. And I'll take any questions if there are any. Thank you so much, Felipe. That was such an awesome overview of machine learning applications and examples. We don't have any questions right now, um, but we do have an extra five minutes here. So if anybody has a question, feel free to put it into the tutorial channel now and we can get it answered. I see one person is typing, so. Maybe we've got a question on the way. I really enjoyed your talk though. And I know there are quite a few groups uh, working on projects with machine learning models. So hopefully this was relevant to them. Yeah, it's usually tempting to get a data set that just works um, where we can see the clustering from the K-means to the K-NM and then we can do a supervised K-NM and have a high score and a working model. But I tried something different. I think negative results and how you can explore data and learn about the data when things don't work as expected can be useful. And this is exactly that case. Things didn't work as expected. The data is imbalanced and it took us three different techniques to figure that out. Yeah, absolutely. I completely agree because your data, it's always gonna have some issues, right? Um, yeah. Miriam's asking where the link for the recording will be. That'll be posted later. It'll be a link on to YouTube, so that video will be up for you to watch as many times as you'd like. Mira is- Please don't. <laughs> Please do, watch it a hundred times. Mira is asking, I wonder what is the difficulty during your trying machine learning method? Um, Mira, do you have any extra detail there about specifics? What's the difficulty? Hmm. I'm not sure if I understood, but the most challenging part of this is the data set. The data set is small. Um, the data set is unbalanced. Um, and we simplify the data set. If you remember from my very first notebook, let me put it here again. We are not using the whole spectrum of colors. We simplify it to a single RGB value, right? Not sure if you can see that. So this may be wrong. And in fact, we know that sometimes we may be wrong. If you see on a high eroded palette like this, the yellowing is this, not this gray, right? Because this represents the old age. It just got peeled off and we're seeing newer plastic underneath it. So to actually predict something like this, we may need to keep the full spectrum or, or maybe select this particular point or keep the full spectrum of colors and do a more complex analysis in there. 
but we need to try the simple things first before we move to more complex analysis. Awesome. I hope that was helpful, Mira. That was a good answer. And I don't see any other questions coming in now, but if folks have any questions later, do not hesitate to put them into the tutorials channel and we'll get them answered later on. So thank you, everybody. And Paige or Sophie, can I pass this back to you? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. I think we now will take a 15 minute break. And we will see you back for our next tutorial.